Welcome to BP Online. We're a church that meets in North Central Calgary with people from all over the world, from all different walks of life, and we're excited you're joining us today. We hope that as you watch online, you're encouraged and challenged in your faith, and most of all, that you encounter Jesus. If you're checking us out for the first time, welcome. You're in the right place at the right time. Whether you're watching us at home or on the go, we hope you'll be impacted by the service today. Thanks for joining us. We will be starting in just a few moments. Welcome to church this weekend, everyone. We're so glad you're joining us, as always. Why don't we stand wherever you are? If you're joining us online, we want to welcome you to church as well. Let's sing and let's worship the Lord together. Here we go. Now it is 
failures, bring your addictions, come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting, God so loved the world. Church, I'm so excited for this weekend. My name is Apope, and I'm one of the youth pastors here. And I want to just, just say that I'm so glad that you are here. God brought you here for a purpose. God brought you to our online stream for a purpose. So I'm glad that you are here. And just reflecting on the song we just sang, and uh, last kind of Friday, we got a chance to talk to our youth about money and giving. And the youth came up to me after. It's like, oh my goodness, I loved half of your talk. And I was like, that's half more than people like, so that's good. But, um, but it's crazy because she came up and she's like, I love that after you're talking. You talked about giving a lot to God, but what has God done for me? And there was a light bulb moment because I was like, God has given you everything. He didn't withhold anything from you. He gave up his life so that you would have life. And out of that, we can give abundantly. Amen. So when we talk about God giving up his son, that means a lot. So when I say, isn't it so good to gather in church? Isn't it so amazing that we have a God that keeps giving? Isn't it so good? It's so good. And we get to keep going. So we're going to go into and continue um, I'm singing. And we actually call this worship because we believe that just as God gives us, God can actually speak to us right here today. So we, we, we posture our heart to receive that. So it's going to be great. we got an amazing service for you. Uh, one of my greatest friends, Michaela, she, we, I work with her. She's going to be preaching this weekend. Come on. She's part of the U team. She's going to be preaching on John 8 and how God is the light of our world. So it's going to be an amazing service. So why don't you join me in prayer? Um, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much because, God, you continue to give. And we're so thankful. Whether we've been Christians for 50 years or maybe we just walked into church in the last five minutes for the first time, God, you want to give to us equally yourself. And that's amazing because <laughs> that is just out of how much love you have for us. So for some of us who are feeling unloved this weekend, God, help us to grasp the greatness of your love and help us by the end of this service to know that, God, we might be walking through a tunnel, but God, you're not just the light at the end of the tunnel. You're the light in the tunnel. Thank you, Jesus. In your amazing name we pray. Amen. Come on. Who's excited to be at church this weekend? Come on, you got to do better than that. Who's excited? Let's go.
Jesus lives in me, for I was dead in sin, but I woke up to see the light. Joyful sound, oh, 
worship you. We worship you.
really struggling with your relationship with your students. Maybe things aren't looking well in your workplace. Maybe you're dealing with something in your family and there's a lot of shame around it. I just want you to know this. You are not alone. You are not alone. The scriptures, God says that there's a word that, that when two or more are gathered, I'm right there. But just because he's right here, doesn't mean we're always open to what he's saying. Doesn't mean we're always open to what he's doing. So in this next moment, the next 10 seconds, why don't we just posture ourselves? If, if you're not a Christian, you know, take a risk. You don't have anything to lose. You just waste the 10 seconds. That's fine, I'll pay you back for that. But if you are a Christian, Let's just posture ourselves with the next 10 seconds and say, Holy Spirit, come. Jesus, speak to me. I know that I can't do this on my own. I can't fix my family on my own. I can't take away shame on my own. Someone said this recently, the gospel is not shame on you. The gospel is shame off you. That's because of what Jesus has done. So Jesus, I need you right now. I say your name, Jesus, over my situation. I say your name, Jesus, over my mindsets, destructive habits, patterns. I say, Jesus, bring your freedom because I know that at your name, every darkness trembles. You are the King of kings. You are the Lord of lords. There's nothing above you. You rule it all, Jesus. Your kingdom is always breaking. And yes, we don't always get the healing, God. But God, it's still breaking in right now. You're with us, God. And your light, it doesn't just bring light to our eyes. It doesn't just bring light to our body. It brings life. And not just life in heaven, life right now, the ultimate life. So we say, Jesus, Jesus, speak to me right now in the midst of my darkness. I don't want to feel alone. I don't want to do this alone. Bring people around me to walk with me. Bring breakthrough. Bring freedom in your name so heavenly father we pray that over our church over those online over those who might not even be christian that are here right now wondering what is this all about god we just ask that you bring your freedom through your name into their lives right now that they wouldn't come into this this gathering they wouldn't come into our stream and leave the same but they would be transformed by your light in jesus name amen Amen. Amen. Come on. Isn't it so good to know the name of Jesus? I don't know about you. You don't have to clap. I'm going to clap. It's so good to know the name of Jesus. I'll just get hyped by myself on the stage because God is so good. Amazing. Well, why don't you guys sit down? We're going to do a little bit um, something different. We actually have um, a special um, service for our grads. I don't know if you guys know that uh, we love our grads and, and we want to celebrate them. So, um, if you have, have graduated, um, like, you know, recently, um, if you're a high school grad or if you are, you know, you just completed your master's or something, I don't know, like whatever you graduated from, wanna, we want to honor you for the next couple of moments. So, so if you are a grad, why don't you come up to the front? We have a special um, even gift for you, so, so don't be afraid. Um, this book is called Winning the War, and it's by a pastor. Win the War in Your Mind, a pastor... Craig Rochelle, Pastor Mark loves this book, um, highly recommended it, um, and it's just all about breaking free from destructive patterns. So it combines brain science and, and the scriptures together. So it's a gift worth getting. So if you're a grad, if you want to come up to the front, want to pray with you, want to honor you with that, come on, give a round of applause. So good. So good. Amazing, amazing. Yeah, you guys can just stand here. And, and typically what we do is that we just kind of ask you your name and what... Um, what you graduated from, and, and what are your plans moving on. So I'll start with you. Usually Pastor Mark is up here and I'm helping, but I'm doing two things at once. So hopefully the camera's getting it. So what's your name, what you graduate from, and, and what are your plans moving forward? My name is Celestine. I graduated from fashion design. Wow, that's amazing. Um, I don't know yet, but it's God's plan for my next step. I love that. That's amazing. So good. So good. What about you? Uh, my name is Therese Maslin, and I graduated with my Master's of Business Administration, and I plan to 
Wow, that's a look at the applause. I'm an MBA yet, and I plan to put that together towards um, inspiring my career to different things. That's amazing. So good. So good. Our church, for the next minute, why don't you just stretch your hands and we're just going to pray over these amazing women of God and just um, that God will be with them um, in this next season of their, of their lives. So, yeah, stretch out your hands. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much. God, you are so good. We know how hard it is, a lot of us, to, to go through school and balance that with so many other responsibilities. But, God, these children of yours have made it through. And they've overcome. So we thank you for that. God, we ask that whatever they go into, God, it wouldn't just be uh, a job. But, God, they would actually find their calling, God. That, God, as they kind of navigate what job they want, God, but it would be a role that, that when they wake up in the morning, they're excited because they get to do it unto you, God. So we pray that you strengthen them, God. And, God, as they're even looking for work or looking for the next step or maybe some of them going into more school or more education, God, we just ask that. I know that things can be hard mentally, but God, we just ask that you would bring your freedom and your peace, God. That anxiety and depression, that would melt away, God. And they would trust in you in this next season, God. And God, we just even ask that as the church, God, we will come alongside them. They would find connections within the church. They would find, with the free time they have, they will find ways to just connect more and empower your people, God. In Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, again, for what you've done in their lives. And we just pray that um, from now on, they will continue to go from glory to glory, from more opportunities to more opportunities, from more just incredible, just ways to advance your kingdom in your amazing name. Amen. Amen. Why don't you give it up for our grads, everybody? Um, I'll give you this copy, and I'll, I'll get you a copy after, afterwards. Amazing. Well, why don't you guys stand up um, and just, you know, try to find someone uh, you don't know and say hi to them and just welcome them to church. Junior highs, you guys are dismissed. I mean, you guys are not dismissed. You guys are in the building because Pastor Michaela is going to be preaching an amazing message. So junior highs, you guys can stay in the building. Your youth pastor is going to be speaking. So why don't you put your eyes up to the screen? We have announcement videos for you guys. Hey, it's Pastor Brandon here, and I want to welcome you to BP Church. If you're watching online or in the building, guess what? A huge hello and welcome. We're so glad that you're here. In fact, so much that we are glad that you are here that there is a connecting card in the seat back in front of you, and we would love for you to take a few moments and fill out as much information as you feel comfortable giving us, uh, and that way we can get to know you a little bit better. Take that to the Take 3 booth out in the foyer. We'll put a little gift in your hand. Answer any of your questions, welcome you, and just tell you that we're so glad that you're with us today. And for those of you that have come prepared to give as we try to reach 1% of North Calgary, our giving boxes are at the back, our giving stations in the foyer, also online, bbchurch.ca slash give. So once again, on behalf of BP Church and its staff, we want to welcome you today. Well, just a couple quick things to remind you of. The first is that just remember to keep Pastor Mark in prayer. He has completed his second week of his sabbatical. And sometimes, you know, as staff, when the cat's away, the mice play. Hey, not fooling around. Get back to work. And by mice playing, I mean keeping office hours and diligently studying the word. Yeah, so just continue to pray for Mark and Andrea for vision and um, just infilling for whatever he needs for when he comes back for our future in the fall. Hey parents, I'm Danielle, one of the summer interns here this year. And I just wanted to let you know that youth is going on a two week break and we'll be starting again on July 14th with our summer kickoff. You can check out bpyouth.ca for more info. Hey BP fam, my name's David and I'm a summer intern this year with BP Kids. This last week at Park and Play was amazing. We had so many kids come and it was so much fun. I wanna see you guys come in on Wednesday. We're gonna be at Evanston Park um, from 6 to 7.30. The address is going to be on the screen. We'd love to see you guys there. There's going to be lots of treats. It's going to be lots of fun. Can't wait to see you guys there. Hang out adults, this Tuesday, June 27th at 7.30 p.m., we are hosting a barbecue and games night. Our men's ministry is going to be cooking burgers for us, and Pastor Brandon is leading a dodgeball tournament. So if you want an opportunity to throw a ball at Pastor Brandon, come out. That's right, young adults. Bring it! You're excommunicated then. And the final announcement that we have is that right after this service, we'll be hosting a community care ministry fair in the gymnasium, and we want you to be a part of it. Community care groups uh, exist for the purpose of caring for one another, growing deeper, socializing, being on ministry in your local neighborhood. So if you want to grow in community, then you need to find your community in the gym, register for it, get to meet the leaders, and participate in whatever it is that God has for you and your community. 
Well, church, those are all the announcements that we have for this week. we got a special speaker. Michaela from our youth department is coming up to talk about John 8 and the light. Now, there are many lights in our, in our world. There is the flashlight. There is the Christmas light. I hope that you've taken yours down for sure. Or the dreaded red light. Ooh. But at this time, she's going to be talking about the light of the world. So this time, would you put your hands together and welcome Michaela. I want to start out by thanking uh, Pastor Mark Williams and Pastor Brandon for allowing me the opportunity to speak this weekend. Um, it is such a high honor to be up here and to share what God has placed on my heart. So thank you for just uh, helping me and working with me this week and just as I prepped for this message. I also want to thank um, Pastor Harmon. If you guys know him, he was one of the youth pastors here, but uh, Pastor Harmon was one of the first people that called out a gifting in me and allowed me to speak at junior high class. And then I also I also want to make sure I thank Pastor Afope and Pastor Ben, who have both given me copious amounts of opportunities to practice preaching at young adults and youth. And so it is because I am surrounded by such amazing people that want to foster the gifts of our congregation that I get to be here today. So I just wanted to start off by saying thank you, and I'm so glad to be here today. Now, I recognize that a couple of you may not have, you may have seen me on worship, but you may not actually know who I am. So my name is Michaela. I am the youth administrator and the youth pastor, uh, worship pastor here at Beddington. I have been for the last year, and I have been serving uh, with our BP youth. Uh, it'll be 10 years for me this fall, which is pretty awesome. Um, I really, um, thank you. <laughs> Uh, I really just have a passion for the next generation and for stewarding and um, growing the gifts of our next generation because they truly are um, the light of our world and they are going to be the future church. Um, and so I just have such a passion for our students. Um, if you go to the next slide, there's just a little bit more about me just so we can get to know each other before I share what God has been placing on my heart. Uh, so I, uh, so that's my family. I am from a family of six. I have three brothers and no sisters, so it went just as you thought. Uh, it was always full of adventure and lots of, hey, please come try this. We've definitely tested it before. Um, I also, my background in education, I am a, I have a bachelor's in science of nursing and I am a licensed registered nurse. Um, I love to travel. That's something that I, uh, oh, I just love experiencing new cultures. Um, so something about me is I love to travel. Um, my husband, I am married. He was actually playing electric tonight. His name is Bogdan. Uh, we will be married three years this Tuesday, which seems wild. Um, and uh, last but not least, um, something I really enjoy to do is I love to hike. Um, I just love being outside in nature, and I love being um, just surrounded by God's great creation. And so this past year and last year, I actually had the opportunity to hike to a place called Canyon Creek Ice Caves. Has anyone ever been there in Brad Creek before? Okay, a couple of people have been there. That's, that's good. I'm not the only one. Well, Canyon Creek Ice Cave, if you go to the next slide... Um, it's this giant 60-foot cave that is just chilling in the middle of the mountains. And this was the first time in my entire life that I actually went hiking and I experienced the phrase pitch black. When you are in this cave, you are walking and I'm getting in there and we're going further back into this cave and the darkness is around and, you know, my first instinct is I'm starting to pray because I'm like, Lord, there's something in this cave. It is so dark. And my brother and I, we, we ended up going back this year, and that's that first picture you can see on the side of him and me looking at each other through a crevice. But it's one of the first times where I've actually turned off the lights, and I experienced where I put my hand in front of my face and I couldn't see it. That's how black it was. And I think in all of our lives, we have had an experience with darkness, for some of us, it's turning on that light night, that night light before we go to bed because, you know, when you wake up in the middle of the night, you got to just make sure you have a sense of direction of where you are. For some of us, maybe as kids, this was definitely me, you're totally fine playing outside and downstairs in the basement, but as soon as those lights go off, you run to the top of the stairs because something's going to come and get you, right? For some of us... It might be we're walking down a street that we always walk down, but at nighttime, for some reason, it feels different. 
There's an ominous, there's this presence, there's something that the darkness brings that just makes us feel uneasy. And many times in our lives, we walk through situations and seasons of our life that feel uneasy and they feel dark. And maybe for some of you sitting in here today, that darkness just hasn't seemed to leave. It just follows you. And so today I have the great opportunity of talking to you about the light and the light of the world that we have in Jesus. So last week, um, Pastor Brandon alluded that in the book of John, which is where we are going to be talking today, Jesus makes seven I am statements. These statements, um, if you go to the next slide, they should be on there or up there. And when Jesus is making these I am statements, what he is essentially doing is saying, I am God. I am the one from the Old Testament. I am the one in the New Testament. I am God. I am he that you have been waiting for. And so today we are going to be looking at the time when Jesus says, I am the light of the world. And so if you have your Bibles here today, I'd love for you guys to turn to John chapter 8. We're going to be starting at verse 12. And while you do that, I'm just going to kind of paint you a picture of where we are at when we see Jesus. So John chapter 8, for those of you that maybe have never been to church before, is a book in the Bible in the New Testament, which is a collection of letters and eyewitness accounts of the life of Jesus while he was alive on earth and then when he died and after uh, he resurrected and the life of the early church. And so John, the author of the book, was one of Jesus's closest friends. He was in Jesus's inner circle of three. And so we are hearing his eyewitness account of doing life with God. And so in John chapter 8, we find ourselves in this place during the season of something called the Feast of the Tabernacles. The Feast of the Tabernacles was a a Jewish tradition that actually still goes on today, which is really wild, um, where they come to celebrate when God provided for the Israelites after their, their freedom from slavery in Egypt. The Israelites wandered through the desert, and God provided for them by sending manna from the sky. He provided water for them through a rock, and he provided light through the, for them in a pillar of cloud and light and fire. And so each year at the end of harvest season, the Israelites and the Jewish people would go to the temple and they would celebrate God providing for them. They would celebrate the provision of the crops that they got that year and they would proclaim goodness over their crops in the future. This was one of the the feasts and the festivals where the Jewish people also celebrated a day when every single nation would proclaim the name of Jesus and the name of God and the name of the Messiah that was coming. So this was a very um, uh, joyous festival. And one of the things that took place during this is something called the illumination of the temple. So every single night, there was four giant calabras that were set up in the temple court, 75 feet tall. And each night, they would go and light these calabras, and it would send a bright light into the temple of Jerusalem and into Jerusalem itself. And it was so bright that this light was known to make Jerusalem look like a diamond, And so it would illuminate every single inch of the court of the temple. And every night, the Jewish people would come around into the the temple and celebrate the pillar of fire that guided them through the desert. They would proclaim the good news that Jesus or their Messiah was coming, and they would quote Isaiah chapter 42 and 49, declaring that one day God would be a light for all of the nations. And so all night, they would dance and sing about the goodness and the glory of this light. And they would do this for seven days straight. And so we find Jesus at the end of this seven-day feast, and he's sitting in the temple. And we don't know if whether those lights were still lit or if whether they were extinguished. But Jesus is sitting there in 
a place called the Court of the Women, which was one of the most open places in the temple where the rich and the poor could be there. Men and women could be in this part of the temple. And he's looking around and he says a very, very bold and powerful statement. He says, I am the light of the world. That light that you have been celebrating for weeks, that person that you've been chanting about, that you've been proclaiming, I'm here. Like, imagine that. Imagine going a whole week and being like, we can't wait for the day the Messiah is coming, and he's there. Like, imagine that. And some people will looked at that, and they said, oh, my goodness, this is what we've been waiting for. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He goes, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. And so when he makes this statement, he's saying, I'm the one that you've been waiting for. I'm the one that can pull you out of that darkness. I'm the one that's going to save you. But you need to follow me. You need to follow me. And I love this statement that Jesus makes because he doesn't say, I am a light. He doesn't say, I am a light for men. I am a light for women. I am a light for a Jew. He says, I am the light of the world. It's an open invitation for all of us to be a part of the goodness of God and his glory and his everlasting life through Jesus. And the people in the temple would have known the statement that God made, right? They had just been celebrating it. They had just been proclaiming it in Isaiah. They've been saying all the Bible passages that point to Jesus. So they would have known what he meant. And if I was there, I'd be like, yes, oh my gosh. But some people didn't. And so they started fighting amongst each other. And, you know, it got a little bit catty. And they started calling Jesus an illegitimate child and saying that he didn't have um, a good enough witness. And they go back and forth. And Jesus is like, I'm the light. I am the light. The Israelites followed God. And he led them into their promised land through a pillar of fire. And now Jesus was sitting in the temple and he was saying, let me lead you to the full promise of eternal life. There is this beautiful parallel that was there where God is saying that I was there back in the day and I'm here for you now. But the promised land that I want to lead you into is eternal life and it never ends. John MacArthur describes the light of Jesus, I think, in one of uh, the most beautiful ways. And I think it's on one of my sermon slides if you want to put it up there. But it says, Jesus is the light of truth that dispels the darkness of falsehood and lies. Jesus is the light of wisdom that dispels the darkness of ignorance. Jesus is the light of joy that dispels the darkness of sorrow. The light of holiness that dispels the darkness of impurity and the light of life that dispels the darkness of death. So when Jesus makes this bold claim, this is what he's telling the Israelites. I am the light of truth, the light of wisdom, the light of joy, the light of holiness, and the light of life. But something that kind of caught my eye as I was studying and reading this was kind of the last part of John chapter 8, verse 12. Jesus says, I am the light of the world. I'm here to bring you salvation. But then he goes, he who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. There is a call to action that Jesus asks of us. A choice to follow him. If we want to have the light of life, we have to choose to follow the one who is the light. It's an active choice. And I think that when I, when I looked at this, I said, God, what does it mean to be a follower? Because when I look at the context of our culture today, I think that word, that word has kind of changed its meaning, right? Like we go on to Instagram and Facebook and we follow a bunch of people. And it's kind of this passive participation where you click the follow and then you wait for somebody to update you on their life. Imagine if we 
applied that to our relationship with Jesus, where we just hit follow and we sat there. That is not the follower that God is asking us to be. God is asking us to be somebody who gives full loyalty and support to him. And actually, that's the dictionary definition in the Merriam-Webster Dictionary. So we have this two very different uh, cultural contexts of this word, one that's very passive and one that's very active. And so when we look at this one, I can definitely tell you that I do not give full loyalty and support to the 700 people I follow on Instagram. That would be quite impossible, right? Nor should I, because there are some people that I follow that have vastly different religious views than me, vastly different political views than me, and so I have to be careful who I'm giving my full loyalty and support to. So for me to say that I'm following 700 people is kind of not true, because I'm not. I should really go and update that list, shouldn't I? <laughs> And so as I'm, I'm sitting there and I'm, and I'm wrestling with God about, okay, what does it look like to follow you? He gave me three characteristics of a person that follows him and follows after the light. And they are trust, commitment, and humility. So number one, trust. Can we all say trust? trust. Yeah, I took that from Pastor Norrell. Thank you. Um, it says a follower of the light trusts the one that they are following. If you go to the next slide, I have some pictures. We have lights that we trust in our every normal day life. When we go driving and we're sitting at the traffic light over there, when the light turns green, there's a collective understanding that we all move forward. We all collectively go and trust and move in the one and in the same direction. Trusting that the red light everyone else has means that they would stop. Now, I know we all know that sometimes chaos happens when people don't actually obey that light, right? It's the same thing with blinkers. We all trust that when somebody says they're going to turn into the left lane, that they will. And we all know there's people that sometimes don't use that. And it makes driving very chaotic, but we put so much trust into these traffic lights and these things, and yet sometimes we find it hard to put trust in the light of the world. Right? And the only reason why this works is because everyone had to pass a driver's test, and everyone listened and obeys to the manual that is set before them. And so sometimes I think as Christians, we need to view this traffic light and these turn signals and that book and that manual we have to study the same way we need to view the Bible. When we have these rules that are in place, it doesn't impede on us from being able to drive the, like, and to live and to experience driving to the full potential. We get from point A to point B safely. We're allowed, we go and we don't have to worry. We don't have to stress. We're not constantly thinking, oh my gosh, is this person going to run into me? Is this person going to run into me? There's peace there. So why are we not like that with the manual of life? Why don't we trust the manual of life? God puts these rules in place, not so that he can make us like confined in a box, but so that we can live life and life to the full so that we don't have to worry. Just like none of us right now are worrying whether or not the sun is going to come up tomorrow, we just trust that it does. And in the same way, when we want to go and live that ultimate life and follow God, there needs to be trust. And so we build that trust by reading and knowing who it is we're following. Because how am I going to trust God if I don't know who he is? How am I going to walk in that truth if I've never spent time with him? Because I think what happens when we don't do that is we start to think that our truth is God's truth. And I think I have a slide on truth over there too. But here is the reality of truth. My truth is fleeting. It's inconsistent. It's unreliable. It changes and it lacks the full picture. When I was sitting in that cave and those lights went off and I was in pitch darkness, I was sitting there and I, out of the corner of my eye after a few minutes, I saw a light. And so I'm like, 
my first instinct is not today, Satan, let's pray. But I see this light, and I'm like, oh my gosh, there's a light. And then everyone in the group's like, yeah, I see it too. What do we think it is? And we're trying to figure out what this weird light that has come up is, only to turn on our flashlight and realize there's nothing there. When we were in the darkness, our senses and our truth become an unreliable source because we are blinded by the things that may be in front of us. But in the Bible, God says these things about his truth. He says that they are everlasting in Psalms 117, verse 2. He says that, they, that Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow, so he's consistent and he's reliable. In Ephesians, it talks about the belt of truth being the thing that holds us all together, so it offers us protection. And last but not least, in John 8, when we read further, it's the truth that sets us free. So when Jesus delivers this line and people start arguing, he says to those of you that listened and believed him, that were like, oh my gosh, you're the light of the world. He says, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciple. And you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. The truth will set you free. The truth of Jesus brings freedom from chains. But are you willing to dwell in him? Are you willing to spend time with him? Are you willing to abide in his word so that you know the truth? So that you can walk in his light and get as close to him as possible. The second thing of a follower of light is a follower of the light is committed to their leader. Now, there was a time in my life I worked at Apple, and uh, I was a technician there. And uh, one thing I will say about Apple is they know how to get followers. Sometimes I felt like I was working in a cult because I'm like, how does everyone just, like, believe every product this company pushes out is amazing? Because clearly it's not when I have to deal with a lot of stuff at the, at the bar. But Apple has designed itself to make people completely bought into their product so that they're not just following or liking a product, they actually follow the vision of the company. And so there's other, um, there's other people that also do these, this as well. Um, some people like astronomers. So back in the day, before we had GPS and Apple Maps that would take us everywhere, um, people navigated where they were going based on the lights in the sky. And they would commit themselves to learning and studying the patterns of the stars throughout the years so that no matter where they were, they could point themselves in the right direction. Now, if I was a... If you were to put me into a field today and say, find your way home, I have not put in the time nor the commitment to figure out where I would be. I would get extremely lost because I haven't put in the time nor the effort to actually know how to guide myself home and where to go to get home. And like astronomers, one of my brothers is actually really obsessed with space. <laughs> He studies it a lot, and he literally does not stop talking about it. Once you get him on the subject, it oozes out of every pore in his body. He just gets so excited. He takes on the characteristics of somebody who has studied a long time and knows what they're talking about. And in the same way, we are called to be those people to our friends and family. That if we really want to be the light of God and experience his fullness, we need to know him. We need to commit. We need to be all in with his vision. We can't be people that are half in and half out. Because when you get closer to God, when you commit and you go, what ends up happening is you begin to take on the characteristics of God. You begin to reflect him. You begin to then refract that light to everyone around you. And you begin to be an influence. But that only comes when you choose to commit and go towards the light. But sometimes in our lives, there's things that compete for our attention and different lights that try to veer us off track and say, no, 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 this is who you need to follow. When I think of those things, I think about our cell phones and I think about our television. 
If you think about it, your phone is a light that draws you in and says, everything you need, I can give you. Any question you have, I can answer. Any social interaction you want, I can give it to you. Sometimes when we've had a long day, the TV goes, just binge watch Netflix. That'll help. And we all know it doesn't. <laughs> because what happens is after you've binged a show, you feel worse off than you were before. And maybe for some of you, it's believing in a zodiac sign, where you think that the way that the star patterns are, are telling you who you are, who your characteristics are, and how you should be acting. And so we have multiple things in our lives that are fighting for our attention. And if we are not in our word, if we are not committed to the one who is the light, we are going to be pulled in every different direction. But for some of us, we don't really like to be in the light. Kind of like that first day you're outside after winter and the sun starts coming on and you get kind of sunburned and you're like, yikes, I need to get out of the sun. I think I have a picture of a girl. Looks like she does not want to be outside. And sometimes in our lives, we're like, that's great, Jesus, you're a light, but I'm going to stay here. Because the closer that I get to the light, the more uncomfortable I get because you're exposing things in me. Because when I get closer to you, I'm burning a little bit because you're refining me. And so sometimes we think it's easier to stay in arm's length so that we can hide in the darkness and not be close to the light. But let me encourage you, when you are melting metals down to become silver, there is a refining process that purifies you so that you can reflect the light. And without that pressure and without that season, you're never going to reach the full potential that he has for you. Just like gold would not be gold if it was half silver or if it had half metallic. But getting closer to the light is not just about you. We are called to go closer to the light because we're called to be a witness to other people. And so it's our responsibility to get as close as we can to the light because there's people in your workplaces, there is people in our jobs, there's people at school, there's people that we come by to that need the light of God. And if we're not reflecting, reflecting it, who is? So if we commit ourselves to God, you may go through a season that's painful, he may refine you. He may expose you a little bit and it's uncomfortable, but it's worth it. Because as followers, we need to get to a point where we tell God, the only thing that is worth me seeing are those things that are illuminated by you. The disciples understood this, and in John 6, verse 68, when a bunch of people had abandoned Jesus after he'd given a sermon, he looks to his disciples and he says, are you guys going to go too? And Peter says, Lord, to whom shall we go? You have the words that give eternal life. And the third thing that we need as followers of the light, the characteristics we need to embody, is to walk in humility. Because, to be honest, there's things in our life that we are blinded to. When I was sitting in that cave, I had my hand right up against my face and I could not see it. There was a reality that there was something in front of me and I couldn't see it because the darkness was too thick. And so there are things in our lives that are right in front of us, but if we do not have the light of Christ, we will not see them. And so we need to be able to walk before God humbly and say, you know what, God? I don't have the full picture. I, am, I can't do this without you because there's stuff I cannot see and I'm going to trust you. Imagine this for a second. Imagine that you were put in a forest and you were given two different options. You would have to go down this hill, navigate your way in the dark alone with a flashlight or you could choose to do the same thing but you'd be given a guide that knows the area, and at the end, there would be a house and food waiting for you, right? All of us would look at that and go, why would I not choose option two? I don't want to get lost. But a lot of us in our lives, we choose option one. We, choose, we look at God and we say, you know what, God, I've got this. I'm going to navigate the darkness with my flashlight, 
And what happens is we don't know the terrain, and so we fall and we stumble, we get hurt. We may end up more lost than we were before. And so we need to be able to humbly come before God and say, I can't do this without you. Can you lead me? Can you show me? Because I cannot do it on my own. And the Israelites did this same thing, like we talked about earlier in the Feast of the Tabernacles. They came together to honor God and to say, we could not do this without you. We couldn't have eaten. We couldn't have had water. We wouldn't have had shelter if it wasn't for you. They had this posture of humility. I think sometimes as Christians, we feel like we need to be a certain way before we can present ourselves to the light. Where we feel like we need to somehow get ourselves together, stop dealing what we're dealing with, and then once we're clean, we can approach the throne. And God will take us in that state. And I'm here to tell you today that God accepts you where you are. He, God wants you to come to him because the truth is he already knows. He already knows where you're at. He already knows what you've done. He already knows what you've been feeling. He already knows. So there's no point in hiding it. But the devil loves to come in and twist that and make you feel alone, make you feel isolated, make you feel like you can't come to the light. But I encourage you, come to the light. Because in John 1, verse 15, it says the light shines and the darkness cannot overcome it. Because the truth is, no matter how dark it is, it will never, ever be able to overcome the light. And so when Jesus says, I am the light of the world, that is his promise to you. That no matter what darkness you are walking through, it will not overcome you because he is the light. And that if you choose to follow him, that he is going to bring you out of darkness and that he will give you life everlasting. Pastor Mark, if you want to come up. If we want to have the light of life, we have to choose to follow the one who is the light. We have to trust that what he says is true, even if your emotions don't like it. Because his truth is more important. His truth is everlasting when yours is fleeting. We have to commit ourselves all in to the vision that God has for us so that we don't miss out because we're too scared to go close or we are too scared of being refined. And we need to walk humbly before God and say, I can't do this without you. Because we can't. The truth is we can't save ourselves. No matter how hard we try, we will never be able to save ourselves. And that's why Jesus was here. See, God sent his son to live a perfect life and to die the most brutal death on the cross to take on the sins of the world so that you and me could have relationship with God and life everlasting. That when we die, it does not end here. That there is life afterwards for us. That's a promise and that's hope. And I know that there's some people sitting in this room today that have been stuck in the darkness for so long because you've never experienced the light of Christ. And so in a few minutes here, I'm going to ask you if you're brave enough to say yes to God so that that fullness of light can come into you so that you don't have to walk in darkness anymore. So that those chains that you think are so heavy can start to break. There's somebody in my life that I love very dearly, but he got into a little bit of trouble and he was going through this hard time and he had racked up a bunch of uh, problems in his life. He made some bad choices and he found himself at rock bottom. And for many, many months and years, he struggled with suicidal ideation because the darkness was so thick around him. And it got to the point where he said, I can't do this anymore. And he came to my dad. My dad is somebody in his life that he cares a lot about. And he started to confess and to say things to my dad. 
and this light, this, this weight came off of his shoulder. And my mom told me that he called her that night and said, this is the first time in months that I haven't wanted to take my life. Because there is something powerful that happens when we bring darkness into the light because the darkness can't overcome light. Chains break, people start to experience freedom. And so in a minute, I'm gonna talk to, I'm gonna pray for a couple of people in this room. The first people I'm gonna pray for are those that have never experienced Jesus. And the second people are those that are caught in darkness and have been feeling like, man, I know Jesus, but I feel like I've been walking in the dark for so long and I wanna pray for both of you. So what I'm gonna ask is that everyone close their eyes and bow their heads. And if I have said anything tonight that resonates in you, and you're like, that's me, I need the light of God. I need the light of Christ in my life. I want to be set free. I want to be in eternal life with him. I'm just gonna ask you to be really brave and put up your hand. Every eye down, thank you. Thank you. And then I wanna talk to the second group of people. So those of you in here, if you've been like, man, I've just been feeling darkness for a long time. I just need this weight to be lifted off. I need to be in the light because I can't carry this anymore. I'm also gonna ask you to be bold and I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand. Thank you. So here's what I'm gonna do. The first people I'm gonna pray for, we're all gonna repeat after me. All you're gonna do is ask Jesus to come into your heart. So Father, we thank you for who you are. I believe that you sent Jesus to be my Lord and Savior, that he died on the cross to save my sins and set me free. Lord, today I choose to walk in your light and in your freedom. And all these things we pray in your name, amen. And now I'm gonna pray for that second group of people. Father, I lift up those individuals that raise their hand and even people that maybe just didn't feel like they could. Lord, that are just walking in a season of darkness. Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that you will just begin to break chains right now, Lord. That you will give them the strength and the courage to tell somebody and to bring that darkness into light because your light trumps all darkness. Your light is the one that breaks chains. So Lord, I pray that you will just begin to lift weights off people's shoulders, Lord. That you will begin to fill people with your peace. Lord, that you will just begin to um, remind them that you haven't forgotten about them. Lord, that even though they may walk through the shadow of death, you are with them. That you've walked beside them, you're carrying them, you're holding them, and you are with them that you will not leave them or forsake that. And Lord, I just pray that you will give these people the boldness to come forward and say, yeah, I'm struggling and I need help. And Lord, for those of us that maybe are on the fence of how to trust you, Lord, I just pray that you bring people around them that will encourage them and uplift them and point them towards you. Because we wanna be people who follow after the light. And all these things I pray in your name. Amen. We're just going to sing a little bit of a song here, and then I'm going to dismiss you. So if you guys want to stand, we're just going to declare that Jesus' name is the one that breaks darkness. Jesus' name is the one that brings light. Jesus' name is the one that the shadows cannot deny, and that it will not, (laughs) it will not fail.
come to your life for the first time tonight or asked for a prayer because you feel like you're in a dark place, I would encourage you to not leave today the same. Tell somebody, whether that is the person beside you, we're gonna have an altar team up here at the end. Don't walk through that alone. And for those of you that have accepted Christ, tell somebody because walking with God is a journey and we want to walk alongside of you and uplift you and support you. After the service, we have a community care fair that's happening in the gym. And this is a, a ministry that our church has been putting together so that communities in the city can be a light in their communities. And so we've had um, a bunch of teams come, come together um, in places like Evanston and Country, Coventry Hills and uh, King, King Cora and Sage Hill and all of these different places where people in our congregation have said, yes, we want to serve our communities. And so this is a great place for you to maybe find those in your neighborhood that maybe you don't know attend church or that you didn't know were a Christian and partner with them to be that light in our communities. So at this time, I'll ask our altar team to come from to the front. And if you need prayer, please come up to the front and receive. But for the rest of you, have a great weekend. Be the light that God has called you to be. And uh, yeah, go check out our community care fair. All right, amen. Thanks for watching. If you'd like more information about our ministry, visit bpchurch.ca. Have a great week and live the ultimate life.